صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة غريب مظلوم كربلة قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة سوين you're gathering with a loud remembrance upon محمد وآل محمد For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower onto this gathering with His infinite mercy and compassion, recite the second salawat. As a gift to the soul of our beloved Al Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, Sayyid al Sajideen, recite the third salawat with the, with the loudest of your voices. One of the most powerful emotions which may exist within human beings is the feeling of guilt. Guilt is a self-policing emotion which works as an alert within the human existence once human beings have involved themselves in immoral acts. Any human being, once encountering any unethical or immoral act, will experience guilt. And that is why scholars of human behavior believe that guilt is one of the most powerful and important emotions that exist in human beings and those who are guiltless, meaning those who feel no guilt, are also called psychopaths by the, school, by the scholars of human behavior. Guilt is so powerful that it changes the lives of extraordinary people. As in you've seen people who are extremely lively, extremely energetic, extremely social and friendly. However, when they experience guilt, their life changes 180 degrees. A person who walks at home with so much passion, with so much enthusiasm, with so much energy, with so much love, with smiles, the power of guilt changes this human being to a point when he comes home, he no longer wants to smile. He no longer wants to speak to anyone. He no longer wants to have an encounter. Same goes for work. Those individuals who are extremely social at work. 
They are extremely loving and energetic at work. After the power of guilt takes over them, they no longer want to have a conversation. They no longer want to speak to anyone. They no longer want to be seen in the eye. Not only that, but the power of guilt can also be self-destructing. What do I mean? I mean, when I am guilty of doing something immoral or unethical or something wrong, and I get invited to my cousin's house. The family members are there. And I show up. And every person who looks at me, I ask myself, why is this person looking at me? Why is this person looking at me in a funny way? Why has this person not greeted me the way they used to greet me before? Why hasn't this person responded to my salam the way they used to? And I keep asking myself, do they know of what I am guilty of? Same goes for my place of work. There is a dinner, there is a lunch, there is a party at work. I show up and everyone looking at me while I enter the room gives me the thought that why is everyone looking at me? Why is everyone now silent as soon as I've come in the room? It could be that it's a coincidence for them to go silent when I walked in or it's a coincidence for them to be looking at me all at the same time or it could be true. But at the same time, I keep telling myself it is because they now know what I am guilty of. It is now because they are all aware and discussing the mistake that I have involved myself in. So it's a self-destructing power within us. That it drives us to an extent where I say to myself, listen, I'm better off just staying at home. I'm better off not going anywhere. Why would I take myself out of the house? Go through the misery of having to deal with people who carry hatred, who carry animosity, who carry negative emotions towards me. There is no reason. So I go in a sense of isolation. I isolate myself from the world. I isolate myself from my friends. I isolate myself from my family. And sometimes some people who know about what I've done, some people who know of my guilt, maybe an uncle, maybe an aunt, maybe a parent, maybe a cousin, maybe a friend, will keep reminding me of what I have done. Will keep telling me, how bad this mistake was, how severe this sin is. Not knowing, not knowing that the guilt that I carry within me is powerful enough. It's enough of a punishment. Even if they don't say anything, the way they act, the way they isolate themselves from me, the way they ignore me, as a silent treatment that tells me we are disgusted by you. We are disgusted by, by what you have done. We don't want to have anything to do with you. Many of us, at times, either encounter this scenario or we are involved in such a scenario especially some parents. When, they when their children make mistakes, especially growing up in this country, and sometimes a mistake can be big. So they resort to disowning their children, to driving them away from their homes, to constantly making them feel guilty and horrible for what they have done. Now the question here is, is this the right method? Or is this a method that has not been practiced by the Imams and the Quran and Ahlul Bayt? When we gather in the first 10 nights of Muharram, one of the nights of the 10 nights is dedicated to a man 
by the name of Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi. What is the story of Hur? Hur is a man who intercepted the caravan of Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He captured him, his family, and he intercepted them. And you know the story, when he came, he was thirsty, his cattle were thirsty, Imam gave them water, he gave the cattle water, he fed them. Then Imam says, Hur, write a letter to your Amir to let me travel in this earth freely. I will not go to Iraq. I will not go to Medina. Allow me to travel freely, but I will not ba give bay'ah. No? I will not give bay'ah. So he wrote the letter thinking that the letter is going to come back saying, yeah, give Hussein permission to travel in, in this earth freely. Not knowing that he was going to send an army of 25,000 men. So when the army gathered, Umar ibn Sa'ad came, Shimr came, they made an army of 40,000 people. Hur went to Umar ibn Sa'ad the night. Obviously he was feeling guilty for what he has done. He's intercepted the caravan of Imam Hussein and he's held him down until 40,000 enemies have came now to kill him. So he is the cause. He goes to Umar ibn Sa'ad, he says to him, will you truly kill Hussein tomorrow? Will you truly fight him tomorrow? Umar ibn Sa'ad says, we'll not just fight him. We will not just kill him. But we will fight him, we will kill him, we will behead him and take his head to the Khalifa. So, Hur came out. He went near the tent of Imam Hussein. He heard, he says, it was like a beehive. He sees some of them in ruku', some of them in sujood, some of them reciting the Quran. He goes closer to the camp of Umar ibn Sa'ad and he sees them drinking and gambling and laughing and being obnoxious. So he stood and he said, أُخَيِّرُ نَفْسِي بَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ وَوَاللَّهِ لَا أَخْتَارُ عَلَى الْجَنَّةِ شَيْئًا I now have stood between heaven and hell, right or wrong, حق and باطل. And wallah, I will not choose anything above Jannah. I will not choose Jahannam above Jannah. So he went, مطأطئاً رأسه. The traditions say, with his head down, he went to Imam Hussein. Listen to this. So Hur ibn Yazid came, مطأطئاً رأسه to Imam Hussein. And he said, As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam Hussein came out of the tent. He said, Man ant? Who are you? He said, Sayyidi, ana alladhi ja'ja'a bikum al-tariq. Oh my master, I am the one who has caused this. He didn't say his name. He was too ashamed to say his name. He was too ashamed to say, I am Hur. He said, I am the cause of this. Now Imam Hussein, what was his response? His response was, Hur, now you come after you've done this. After tomorrow morning, in a couple of hours, we'll all be killed. We will all be beheaded. Then my wife, why my children and my, the woman will be taken as captives. Hur, now you show up? Did Imam Hussein say this? Did Imam Hussein even remind him of what he has done? Sayyidi, ana alladhi ja'ja'a bikum al-tariq. Imam Hussein's response. He says, halli min tawbah. Is there a tawbah for me? Me. Hur, after what I have done. Imam Hussein says, وَعَلَيْكَ السَّلَامْ تُبْتَى بَاللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ It's as simple as that. Peace be unto you. You know what it means to have one salam from Hussein ibn Ali? Salamun alaykum tibtum. 
وطابت الأرض التي فيها دفنتم وفزتم والله فوزا عظيما Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq, the founder of the madhab. He stands in front of the graves of the companions of Imam Hussein. He says, may I be sacrificed for you and for the land that you are buried in. Huh? So he says, Tubtab Allah alayhi. Ask for repentance, Allah will forgive. Meaning, meaning, oh parents, listen. Meaning, if Allah can forgive you, oh hur, who am I not to forgive you? Meaning, if Allah is not judging you now, He's going to forgive you, who am I to judge you? Who am I to judge you? Who am I not to forgive you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, forgive those who have wronged you and Allah will forgive you in the day of judgment. Let us learn how to forgive. Let us know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put this enormous part, this important part, this dimension with our soul known as al-nafsul lawama. And Allah swears by this nafs in the Quran. He swears by the importance of this nafs but not for us to keep nailing people on the head and belittling them for a mistake that they have done. But to be able to use that nafs to help others, to hold them by the hand, give them strength, let them get back on their feet, tell them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, the most compassionate. This is what Imam Hussein did with Hur. He held him by the hand. Hur was fallen. He was broken. He had nothing. He had no one. Imam Hussein got him back on his feet. Sometimes people make mistakes in our community. They have to go say goodbye to the community. They have to kiss the good community goodbye. Sometimes not even them. Their children make mistakes, but they have no ability to come to the community anymore. Sometimes their relatives make a mistake, but they do not have the ability to take part in the community anymore. Why? A person comes to Al-Imam Al -Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein, Zain al-Abideen, he says to him, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I have committed a huge sin. But I am now in Hajj. I have done the Tawaf. I have worn the Haram. I have done the Sa'i. I have gone to Mina, Arafat. I still wonder, has Allah forgiven me? Imam Zainul Abidin says to him, Your doubt in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has yet not forgiven you is a greater sin than what you had achieved previously. Whatever it may have been in the past that you've done, is a greater, is minor. And now, the fact that you, after your hajj, after your ihram, think that Allah, the Arham al rahimin has not forgiven you, is a bigger sin, is a greater sin. And that is why I want to talk about this topic in the following manner. Number one, Islam, the religion of forgiveness. Number two, Allah loves to forgive. Number three, Quran, the book of forgiveness. And number four, how do we get our sins forgiven? After your loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> the religion of Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, reminds us every day to ask for forgiveness, and it reminds us every day that we are forgiven. How so? We are asked to pray five times a day. And indeed, some of us who combine the prayers and pray in three different times, but five prayers, will do wudu three times, and it's okay. However, wudu is mustahab before every salah. So even if you're combining, it is highly recommended that between Dhuhr and Asr you do a wudu. Between Maghrib and Isha, 
you renew your wudu. For wudu is nur, and wudu upon wudu is nur on ala nur. Some people, they come and they say, say it. Wudu was for 1,400 years ago. When people were going in the masjid, their feet were smelling, and their hands were dirty. They used to work in the, in the fields, in agriculture. So they wash their hands, they wash their face, they wash their feet, and they come now. In the morning, I wake up, I take a shower, I use soap, I use cologne. I don't see the meaning behind wudu. Why do I have to do wudu? Can't I just do wudu in the shower? Yes. If your philosophy of wudu is just slapping some water on your face and your hands, then yeah, you don't have to. After you do a shower, you can... But what is the philosophy of wudu? When I wash my face, there are special traditions, hadiths, that indicate the dua and the supplication surrounding the wudu. So the first time I wash my face, I ask Allah for forgiveness for the sins I have accumulated with this face. Oh Allah, forgive the sins of my eyes. Oh Allah, forgive the sins of my tongue. Oh Allah, forgive the sins of my ears. Oh Allah, forgive the sins of my thoughts and my intellect. Then the second time I wash, Oh Allah, give me the strength, the ability not to sin with my eyes, not to sin with my tongue. When I wash my hand, Oh Allah, forgive the sins of this hand, of those fingers, forgive them. The second time, Oh Allah, strengthen this hand. Not to disobey you. Oh Allah, my left hand, forgive its sins. Then from head to toe, when I wipe my head to my toes, from head to toe, oh Allah, this is a declaration that I have sinned. I am a sinner from head to toe. I am weak to you from head to toe. I am in need to you from head to toe. Oh Allah, forgive my sins head to toe and give me the strength to be a true abd to you. Then we stand for salah. This philosophy of wudu, yes, it is beautiful. It is not only beautiful to do it three times a day, but five times a day. And that is why the urafa tell you to remain on wudu all the time because this wudu guards you from sin. This wudu gives us special nur according to the hadith. Now, when I understand that when I perform wudu, Allah has forgiven my sins. When I perform ghusl al-jum'ah, and I wash my entire body in the day of Friday, it is meant to cleanse me, purify me from all that I have accumulated in the week. Huh? When I know that the religion of Islam constantly teaches me that I am forgiven, that I am cleansing myself, purifying myself, we declare the religion of Islam as the religion of forgiveness. Allah, number two. Allah loves to forgive brothers and sisters. Isn't he the one that says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. O oh, you who have drowned in sin, drowned in sin, do not despair from the mercy of Allah, for Allah forgives all the sins. Allah forgives all the sins. And if they ask you about me, tell them I am near. I am close. They don't have to struggle to find me. I am always there. All they need to do is call on to me. That is why in dua, Joshan, this dua that's the legacy of our Imam Zain al Abidin, what do we say to him? يا حبيبا من لا حبيبا لا ويا مؤنسا من لا مؤنسا لا 
ويا جليس من لا جليس له سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب Oh the beloved of those who have no beloveds The friend of those who have no friends The acquaintance of those who have no one to sit with and converse with He is Allah He is the true friend Believe me Today you can think of your best friend Write his name Now go and do something really bad I'm not encouraging it of course I don't want you to do that Once he may forgive you Twice, he may forgive you. Ten times, he's not going to forgive you. Your parents, once, twice, ten times, a hundred times, they will still not forgive you. They'll say so many times you've done the same mistake over, over, and over, and over again. How many times, how many chances do you want? But Allah says you are always welcomed back. There is no such thing as creating a barrier between you and me. Isn't this the true Habib, the true beloved, the true friend? Someone you can really rely on? Musa ibn Imran alayhi wa ala alihi wa ala nabiyina wa alihi afdalu salati wa salam was going to speak to Allah for 30 days. Then Allah added another 10 days. So it became 40 days. But Allah... Says Musa, you tell your people, you are a prophet of Allah, that you are leaving and you choose a successor who was Harun. He appointed a successor. He says, I'm going for 30 days to meet Allah. So the people thought it was 30 days. But 10 days were added. They were tested in the 10 days. How? With their Khalifa. Musa's people were tested in the Khilafah. And Muhammad's nation was also tested in the Khilafah. So Musa, when he was going, he saw old man. Old man says to him, Musa, come here. So Musa, he came. He says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to speak to Allah, to Mount Sinai, to have a conversation with Allah. So he says to him, can you take a message? Yeah, I can take a message, sure. He says, when you see him, tell him, I hate him. I don't want to have anything to do with him. Tell him, in fact, I don't want him to send me food and shelter. I don't want anything with him. So Musa, he became very angry with him. He said, I will never deliver this message. You're an ungrateful abd. And left, he left. So... Musa began the conversation with Allah 20 days, 30 days, 35 days, 36 days, 37 days, 38 days, 39th day Allah said, Musa, do you have a message for me? Musa says, no, ya Allah. No. Musa, are you not forgetting something? No, Allah. Are you sure, Musa, there's nothing you're forgetting? No. And Musa says, Allah, there is a message, but I cannot deliver this message. It's from an ungrateful abd. Allah says, listen, listen, this is the merciful Allah. He says, oh Musa, is this message from, for you or for me? He says, Allah, it is for you. Then Allah says, Musa, deliver the message. So Musa delivers the message. Then Allah says to him, Musa, go to this man and tell him, since I created you, I will always take care of you. I will always look after you. I will always send you your nourishment. You are my abd. Ya man yu'ti man sa'ala. Ya man yu'ti man lam yas'al wa man lam ya'rif tahannunan minhu wa rahmah. Oh, the one who gives to those who know him and remember him. And to those who do not know him and do not remember him. But he is so merciful. He is so kind. He is so compassionate. Allah loves to forgive. 
There was a man in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. His name was Hanzala, Hanzalatun Nabash. Go read about him in the books. His job was used to dig graves and steal the shrouds. This was his job. When people would get buried, he digs the grave and steals their shroud. Hanzalatun Nabash. A young lady, she was on her deathbed. She called him, she says, Hanzala, no man has ever looked at me. I am giving you the shroud, the skeffan. Take this. When I die in a couple of days, I don't want you to come to my grave. So first he was in denial. He said, no, I don't do such things. Astajiru billah, na'udhu billah. But I will take the kafan anyways. So she said to him, not only the kafan, take some money too. Take this money. Do not come to my grave. So he gave her a promise. He gave her a promise. She died. They buried this young woman. He went to her grave. Shaitan comes. Shaitan says, but now she's dead. Who cares about the promise you made to her? Go. So he went, he dug the grave and he stole the shroud of this young lady. Not only that, but he took advantage of her. In that moment, we have two nafs in our, in our existence. We have one nafs, it is our nafs, two dimensions. And nafs al-ammara bisu. And nafs al lawama. Nafs al lawama is guilt, the rebuking soul, what we have been discussing. And nafs al awara bisu is the one that drives us to do evil, so they create a balance. At that moment, and nafs al lawama, the guilt, the rebuking soul, tackled the other one down. It said, Enough is enough. So he realized. He realized what he has done. Allahu Akbar. What is this sin? So he ran towards Rasulullah. He says to him, Ya Rasulullah, I have sinned. I want to ask for forgiveness. Rasulullah says, How great is your sin? He says, Ya Rasulullah, it is very great. Rasulullah knows. He has the knowledge of the unseen. So he says to him, Oh man. Is your sin greater or the heavens? He says, my sin. Is your sin greater or the earth? He says, my sin. He says, is your sin greater than the universe? He says, my sin. Then Rasulullah tells him, is your sin greater or the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, the mercy of Allah. The mercy of Allah is greater than mercy. So he says, then go seek the mercy of Allah. This man goes in the desert. He shackles himself. He asks for repentance. And he vows that he's not going to go back until Rasulullah informs him that he's been forgiven. After 40 days, the angel Jibra'il comes. Ya Rasulullah, go tell Hanbala. That Allah has forgiven not only that sin, He has forgiven all His sins. He has no sins in His record now. So Rasulullah took some of the companions. They saw Hanzala in his last moments. He was not eating and drinking, and he was. So Rasulullah says to him, Ya Hanzala, you have been forgiven. Jibra'il informs me, You have been forgiven. So he raises his hands. He says, Oh Allah, now that you have forgiven all my sins, take me away before I commit another sin. He was taken to Allah as a pure man. Sinless man. Allah loves to forgive. The book of Quran the last revelation of Allah is the book of forgiveness. If you look at the verses from the beginning of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim until the end of the Quran, it is directly or indirectly speaking of mercy and forgiveness. It's the theme of the Quran to be forgiven 
that Allah forgives, that Allah is merciful, that Allah is compassionate, that Allah is kind. And Allah tells us the story of the Prophet Yunus. Yunus kept telling his people, kept telling his people, oh people, come to Allah, come to Allah. Many years, only two people believed in him. Only two people believed in him. Until he cursed his people. So Allah says, Yunus, informs them, inform them that the punishment is coming to them. So he got up, he said, listen, the punishment of Allah is coming to you. You cannot escape the punishment. They said to him, Yunus, which punishment? What is this baloney? Go. So he said, fine, I'm leaving, but you're going to see the punishment. It's going to be four days, the skies will change color, and then the fifth day, Allah will shower his punishment. They didn't believe him. As soon as he left, yes, the sky changes color. They realized everything that he had told them is, is taking place. The punishment is imminent, so they went to his home knocking at the door. He's not there. They went to the other guy, the carpenter. He, they knocked at his door. He wasn't there. There was another man who believed in Eunice, but he was still there at his house. As soon as they showed up, he opened the door. He said, I know what you want. I know why you're here. You're here to look for Eunice. Eunice is not here, but the Lord of Eunice is here. What should we do? He said, all of you barefoot, everyone in the city, you go to the desert. There, when everyone's heart is sincere, then Allah will forgive you all. That is why I keep saying, I said this yesterday, I will say this today. When we do dua, this is a masjid, a house of Allah. We do dua, we raise our hands to Allah, all of us. And all of us go with sincerity. Some people in the time of dua, in the end of the majlis, which is the most important aspect, you see them, they're sitting like this. Why, brother? This is the etiquette of dua. You're speaking to your Lord. It's like speaking to someone important, but not looking at them. This person is here. You're talking to them while looking this way. Is this part of the etiquette of speaking to someone? No. Part of the etiquette of speaking to Allah is raising our hands. There is no shame in that. Is shedding tears for Allah. There is no shame in that. Is making sure we all together go with pure intentions. Because when we do, Allah will look at this crowd and say, Everyone here and this gathering has come to me in the state of idhtirar. Amman yujibul. So he says, you go to this outside the city, you pray Allah will forgive, and it's true. They went, they asked for repentance, Allah forgive them. The clouds were removed, they went back to their lives. Yunus went into a huge story of, he was in the ship, he was thrown in the stomach of the whale, then he was thrown back. He came to the city, everyone's there. Everyone who was supposed to be punished and die, he was, they were there. But the difference is not, they're not disrespecting him, they're not mocking him. They're coming, kissing his hand, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Yunus. So this is something wrong. He asked one of them, what happened? They said, Ya Nabi Allah, this is what happened. We ask for repentance. Allah bestowed his mercy and his forgiveness onto us. And now we know that you are a true prophet of Allah, so we will follow you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of many stories of forgiveness in the Quran. But he begins the Quran with the notion, the principle of forgiveness. The ABCs of forgiveness. Ya rahmatullahi wa sa'ah. The ABCs of forgiveness. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And then Adam says, Oh Allah, I want to ask for forgiveness. Allah gives him asma, names. And then Yusuf, 
says, Oh Allah, save me from this calamity. Allah gives him names. Ibrahim says, Oh Allah, I want this ship not to sink. Allah gives him names. Musa wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save his people. Allah gives him names. What are those names? You know the names. How do we get? How do we get our sins forgiven? There are many ways. But the easiest way, the best way, the sweetest way is when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of Muhammadin wa Aliyin wa Fatima wa al Hassani wal Hussein sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And amongst them five, one of them is the shining star and that is our Mawla Al-Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Rasulullah says, when I went to the Mi'raj and I saw and witnessed the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something was written underneath the Arsh. I asked Jibra'il, I said, Ya Jibra'il, what is written underneath the Arsh? He says to him, Ya Rasul Allah, it is written, Inna al Hussein, Misbah al Huda wa Safina al Najat. Hussein is the ark of salvation and the torch of enlightenment. Imam Ja'far al Sadiq says, It's Kulluna Sufun al Najat. We are all the Sufun of Najat. We are all the ark of salvation. What is the ark of salvation? Back then, when they went on the ship, and the ship collapsed there was no hope except the rescue boat the rescue boat comes that was the only hope or else they all die Imam al-Sadiq says we are all the rescue boat all of us but the ship of my grandfather Hussein is much bigger and much faster so we say to him Ya Sayyidi Ya Aba Abdullah we have come to you tonight. Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, again, know your value, brothers. Know your value, my sisters. Know the value of this member. Imam Ja'far al Sadiq says, Rahimallahu man ahya amrana. May Allah have mercy on those who rejuvenate and give life to our cause. They become the assistants of Hussein. The allies of Hussein, the companions of Hussein. I said this yesterday. I said, You are the Ansar of Rasulullah. You are the Ansar of Fatima. You are the Ansar of Ali. You are the Ansar of Hassan. You are the Ansar of Hussein. In fact, it is true that you were not there in the day of Ashura present. But today, you are the Ansar of Hussein. And Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari says what? Says, be a witness that we were with them. We fought with them. We became martyrs with them. Ya Jabir, you were not there. You did not hold the sword. He did not engage in battle. He said, yes, but Rasulullah says, man ahabba fi'la qawmin hasharahullah ma'ahum. Whoever desires to be with a group of people but did not have the ability, then Allah gives them the reward. So you are the Ansar of Hussein. Know your value. Uh, Imam al sadiqs dua is most definitely accepted. He says, Rahimallah, oh Allah have mercy on to those who ahya amrana, who give life to our amr. And you're giving life to the amr and the cause of Ahl al-Bayt. And Imam al sadiq does a dua for you all and his dua is most definitely accepted. Habib ibn Madahir al-Asadi, the companion of Rasulullah, the scholar of Qur'an, the alim, the faqih, who became a martyr, and Imam Hussein held him. He embraced him. He gave him that status. Was seen by one of our ulama in the dream. The alim says to him, listen to this. He says to him, what position do you have? He says, the position of four fingers underneath the throne. I don't know what this means. 
No scholar will know what it means. He says, we are four. He said, we are this much of a distance from the throne of Allah. This is the position of Ashab al Hussein, the 72 immaculate, pure companions of Abu Abdullah. He says, You 72 are the best companions that any savior, any messenger, any imam, any successor would have. No one has had the 72 that I have. And they are given that position in the day of judgment. He says to him, Is there any wish that you have? Any wish that you have, oh Habib Ibn Madahir, he says, yes, there is one wish. What is the wish? He says, I wish that one day I can come and participate in one of the majalis of Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He says to him, why? He says, because there in that majlis, Rasulullah and Fatima to Zahra are seated by the door. Welcoming their guests in commemorating the Aza of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Ya Sayyidi Ya Ali ibn al Hussein, Ya Zain al Abidin. You have no zuwar, no visitors today standing in front of Baqi. You have no za'ireen beating their chests, doing aza, shouting out your name. But we are your visitors, we are your Shia Mawlaya Sayyidi. We direct our souls to you all the way from here to Medina. We say to you, all of us together, Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana, inna tawajjana wa stashfana. وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند Ya Wajihan. No, this is unacceptable. The Zuwar of Zainul Abidin tonight, the martyrdom of your Imam Zainul Abidin, all of us together. Ya Wajihan, Inda Allah, Ishfa' Lana, Inda Allah. Ya Wajihan. Yes, there was one majlis, the very first majlis for Abba Abdullah. Where was that majlis? That majlis was in the palace of the Mal'oon Yazid. They brought the women, the children, your Imam Zain al Abidin, and shackles on to the presence of the Mal'oon Yazid. The riwayah says, فَدَخَلَتْ زَيْنَبُ بِنْتْ أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَى يَزِيد Allahu Akbar, Zainab, the daughter of Ali, the sister of Hussain al Hussain, would be taken as a prisoner of war to the callous of Yazid. 
As she entered, she went into a corner so he realized she was Zayna. Imam Zayn al Abidin sat down from the moment that he went into the palace. He began to raise his voice. Ya Yazid, Dalli, Likay Asada, Alaha, Ula, Il Awad, Likay Atakalam, Kalam, and Mila, Fihi, Riva, Waliha, Ula, Il Gulasa, Ejra, who was the Wab. Oh, Yazid, give me permission to go on those pieces of wood. He did not call it Mimbar. Go on the pieces of wood so that I say words that Allah would be pleased with and give ajr and thawab to those underneath the member. So Yazid kept insisting that he was not going to permit him. They went to him, they said to him, Ya Amir al Fasiqeen, Ya Yazid, why is it that you do not give him permission? He is a young man, he's been devastated, he is ill, how can he even say anything? He said, Wallahi inna wu min ahlu baytin zukkul ilma zakka kabiruhum la yukas wa sagiruhum jamratun la tudas. He is from a family and a progeny where they they have consumed knowledge. Their elderly are not in comparison with any other human being. And their youngsters are like coals of fire where you cannot hold on to them. And he will not descend from the member until he exposes me and my ancestry and the family of Abu Sufyan. The Imam insisted to give the very first medlis of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He wanted the honor to be the very first khatib, the very first azadar for his father Abu Abdullah. He went on to the mimbar. Bismillah wa billahi walhamdulillah wa thana'u ala Allah. والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء محمد أما بعد أما بعد أوتينا ستة وفضلنا بسبع أوتينا العلم والحلم والسماحة والفصاحة والشجاعة والمحبة في قلوب المؤمنين وفضلنا بأن منا النبي المختار ومنا الكرار ومنا أسد الله وأسد رسوله ومنا سيدة نساء العالمين ومنا سطى هذه الأمة ومنا مهدي هذه الأمة أيها الناس من عرفني فقد عرفني ومن لم يعرفني أعرفه بحسبي ونسبي Oh people we have been given six and we have been superiorized over the rest of humanity by seven we have been given knowledge eloquence forbearance bravery and love in the heart of the believers and we have been superiorized for from us is the last messenger and from us is the karrar and from us is the tayyar and from us is the lion of allah and from us is the greatest woman and from us are the masters of the youth of paradise and from us is the Mahdi of this Ummah. For those of you who have recognized me, you know me. And for those who have not yet known me, I shall introduce to you myself further. And Abnu Makkata wa Mina, and Abnu Zamzama wa Safa, and Abnu Man Humila ala al Buraq ila Sidrat al Muntaha, and Abnu Man Salla bi Malaikat al Sama imathna imathna, and Abnu Man Kana Qaba Qaba Qawsayn aw Adna, and Abnu Man Awha ilayhi al Jalil ma Awha, and Abnu al Habib al Mustafa. I 
am the son of the man who was elevated by the Burak to the seventh heaven. I am the son of the man who led the congressional prayers, congregational prayers with the heavenly angels. I am the son of the man who became Qaba Qaba Qawseyn Aw Adna. I am the son of the seal of the prophets. I am the son of the man who received the final revelation. I am the son of the beloved of Allah. I am the son of Muhammad al-Mustafa. أيها الناس أنا ابن من ضرب بين يدي رسول الله بسيفين وبايع البيعتين وهاجر الهجرتين ولم يشرك بالله طرفة عين أنا ابن يعصوب المؤمنين وتاج البكائين وأصبر الصابرين أنا ابن أول المسلمين وباب حكمة النبيين كبش العراق ليث الحجاز مكي مدني خيفي عقبي من العرب سيدها ومن الوغى ليثها وارث المشعرين وأبو السبطين ذاك جدي علي بن أبي طالب I am the son of the man who fought with two swords and two spears I am the son of the man who gave, who gave both allegiances I am the son of the man who went on both migrations. I am the son of the man who inherited the wisdom of the prophets, the gate to the knowledge of Rasulullah. I am the son of the best of Arabs, the greatest of non-Arabs. I am the son of the man who inherited Hijaz, the father of the Sibutayn, the first to believe in Allah and Rasulullah, the father of the Sibutayn, the father of Hassan al Hussein, that is my grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he continues, Ayyuhanna. أنا ابن نقيات الجيوب أنا ابن عديمات العيوب أنا ابن خير النساء أنا ابن فاطمة الزهراء I am the son of the greatest woman the most pure of women the most noble of women I am the son of خديجة الكبرى I am the son of فاطمة الزهراء now he needs to introduce his father, uh, Al Hussein. So, what did he say? Ayyuhanna Sana ibn Masloob al Imamati wal Rida. Ala ibn Man Haramu min al Sham il al Iraq, min al Iraq il al Sham to survive. أنا ابن من بكت علي ملائكة السماء أنا ابن المذبوح من القفاء Oh people, I am the son of the man who is haram is taken as a captive from Iraq to Shayam. I am the son of the man who the heavenly angels cried and wept for. I am the son of the man who became a martyr next to the Euphrates. I am the son of the beheaded. Then what did he say? I am the son of the beheaded from the back. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Why beheaded from the back? Shabu could not cut the head of Hussein. And he said to him, Ya Shem, Rasulullah, kiss the chest of Hussein. That body was then turned on to the other side. Why does he say, Rahim Allah, الجيب الخضيم رحم الله الوجه الكريم أنا ابن المذبوح من القضاء يزيد سديع مؤذن أذن they said to him it is not the time of Adhan he said I want to end the sermon of Zayn al-Abidin 
صدى مؤذن وانت يزد الله اكبر الله اكبر زين العابدين زز لا اكبر من الله شيء اشهد ان لا اله الا الله زز شهد بذلك لحمي ودمي وعقلي وبشري وجميع جوارحي my entire existence witnesses that there is no god besides Allah then the muaddin Allah akbar the muaddin said ashhad anna muhammad rasul Allah zain al abidin tikab az amam he said ya yazid ahada muhammad jadduk am jaddi an kadhabta wa zamta annahu jaddak fa kadhabta wa kafart wa in aqrart annahu jaddi فلما قتلت أبي عطشانا وظلما بكربلاء سيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين سيدنا would you like to do that to اللهم بحق محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من درية الحسين give us the زيارة of حسين give us the شفاعة of حسين hasten the reappearance of the son of حسين allow our imams heart to be happy and can Content with us, every man, every woman present in this majlis with us, and forgive our sins, conceal our sins, shower on to us from your infinite mercy and compassion. Every mu'min, every mu'mina with a haja, give them their haja. With an illness, give them cure. Those who have passed away, shower onto their graves from your mercy and compassion. Remove the whispers of shaitan away from our hearts. Give us and grant us the life of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Give us the honorable death of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Increase the love of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in our lives. Oh Allah, we ask you to accept this humble aza and remembrance of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh Allah, the founders, the organizers, those who serve the mu'mineen and mu'minat in this community, give them strength. Oh Allah, the followers of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad around the world, give them strength. Oh Allah, destroy the enemies of the followers of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The Zawar of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Oh Allah, give them safety. Return them to their families. Oh Allah, write our names amongst the Zawar of Hussein in this Arba'een. Now all of us rise, all of us together, we remember our Imam. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا برحمة برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين الفاتحة مع الصلوات